what I got. Okay, today we're starting our next lecture, Post-War Society and Culture, the period from 1945 to 1960. It's gonna repeat a little bit of what we talked about when we talked about at Truman, but this is gonna go more into culture uh, as well as follow us through the Eisenhower years. You ready? People of plenty. Now guys, the post-war economy, the main thing about it is the incredible prosperity we have. I mean, our gross national product more than doubles from 1945 to 1960. By the 1970s, the gap of, uh, between the living standards of America and the rest of the world is only widening. I mean, we only have 6% of the world's population Yet, we produced or consumed two-thirds of all of its goods. Now, why were we going so gangbusters? Well, one of the reasons was that big government spending was sustained in the post-war uh, era due to tensions generated by the Cold War. I mean, Korea ensured military spending, and indeed, this uh, military spending was an important stimuli to the post-war economic Boom, the defense uh, research helped spawn the glamour industries of the post-war period like chemicals, electronics, aviation. Now, we also talked a lot about the GI Bill and the things that it did, like with its one-year unemployment insurance, low-cost mortgages. But perhaps the biggest thing was the 14.5 million uh, GIs that use the money to go to college. Now, before World War II, only 160,000 graduated from college. By 1950, it's 500,000. Indeed, in 1949, veterans were 49% of the college enrollments, giving the U.S. the best educated workforce in the world. However, we were less successful in dealing with racial barriers. For example, in 1946, the 9,000 student body of um, the University of Pennsylvania had only um, 46 blacks. And they, of course, were prevented from attending the social functions, from living in the same dorms, from participating in the athletic competitions, well, you might ask, why did they go to historically black colleges, which were around like Grambling and stuff like that? Well, guys, in 1940, there were 43,000 African Americans that went to black colleges. By 1950, there was 77,000, with 20,000 denied uh, admission. Why? They didn't have the space. They couldn't grow fast enough to accommodate the demand. And as a result of this, only a fifth of the 100,000 black veterans who applied for educational benefits had enrolled. Ready for the next slide? Well, how's our uh, economy doing? Guys, it is doing great. Unlike the rest of the world, our factory system wasn't devastated by World War II. In fact, we're also using automation. So in 1945, it took 310 hours to build a car. By 1955, because we've automated, it's now down to 150 hours. Not only that, but consumers had saved up $150 million during the war because they couldn't buy everything they wanted to, or excuse me, not million, billion. And now they were ready to spend. And combined with the fact that now we got a baby boom going on, those are little creatures that are constantly going to need things. Ready? By the way, the baby gooselings are as cute as the dickens, as is the daddy goose. Wait a minute, is the, is the male goose the gander? Or is that the female? I think it's the female. Yeah, the baby 
piece up there. Three of them. All right, consumer culture. <clears throat> Home ownership increased 50% from 1945 to 1960. And as it increased, people now needed goods to fill their homes with. And guys, we have a factory system that's more than ready to supply it. I mean, refrigerators, washing machines, sewing machines, vacuum cleaners, freezers, carving knives. I mean, it just goes on and on. Well, we've got tons of factories that are all producing the same goods. So how am I going to know how one product is differentiated from the other? And for that, we have a new advertising medium, known only as television. In 1946, there were 7,000 primitive black and white sets throughout the United States. By 1960, it's up to 50 million. Nine out of every 10 homes had at least one TV set. And by the 1970s, 35% had the brand new color TV. Well, it should come as no surprise that the most popular periodical during this time was TV Guide. You know, the little periodical that gave listings of what shows were going to be about, a little blur of what was on that week, might have articles with uh, people and TV celebrities. But it's interesting because in 1953, um, city engineers across the United States noticed a real erratic Yet common, uh, common use of water. The water pressure would be all right for about 13 minutes, and then it would plummet for about five minutes. And then it would rise back up for about another 12 minutes. Y'all know what was going on? TV breaks. People were going to the bathroom during commercials everywhere across the nation. All right, now the increased spending we have. Okay, we still have the urban poor as well as the rural poor, um, but we have a growing middle class where weekly visits to the beauty parlor the, or shopping center became routine activities for many uh, working class housewives. I mean, you had families with two cars uh, not being uncommon. Some might even have a camper or a boat. The head of the uh, AFL-CIO, George Meany, stated American labor had never had it so good. And by 1950, blacks were earning on average four times their 1940 wages, prompting one black journalist to declare in 1951 the progressive improvement of race relations and the economic rise of the Negro in the United States is a flattering example of democracy in action. However, the gap between the yearly income between blacks and whites was continuing to grow. But no one is really paying attention to it. Why? Because this is an age of conformity. And we'll get to that a little bit later. You ready? Oh, wow. All right, now the role of advertising. Marketers really pushed self-gratification. Planned obsolescence became a way of selling more goods for many manufacturers. Advertising was a central component in this push. I mean, TV advertising expenditures increased 1,000% during the 1950s. And NBC itself stated in 1956, advertising has created an American frame of mind that makes people want more things, better things, newer things. Well, how are they going to pay for it? Well, guys, consumer use of credit goes up 800%. While the rest of the world is saving 10 to 20% of its salary, Americans in the 1960s only saved 10 per, 5%. One critic said, never before has so much been owed by so many. Ready for the next one? All right, well, what are the cultural effects of this prosperity? Well, we got new places to spend. Shopping centers uh, sweep the nation. Now, a shopping center like this is like most of the shopping centers we 
see today where there'll be a row of stores you know the dollar tree will be right next to half of half which is right next to an auto parts store and you just drive up there and get it there were only <coughs> excuse me eight of them in 1945 by 1960 there's 3840 and also we have some entrepreneurs that go out and do a radical thing they put all the stores within the same building a shopping mall now one of the first ones that was built it was kind of a risk they built it on some farmland that was right outside the city limits of these two cities that were like one was within the other one some people considered it a suburb of the bigger city but those two cities would never admit they were suburbs they had their own city charters everything like that and anyway the people that lived in these cities were incredibly or at least one of them were incredibly wealthy <clears throat> does anybody know what this uh shopping mall was that was air conditioning it was off a street in the city called northwest highway close to a street called Park. Oh, uh, why not? No, Dallas. It was North Park. Oh, really? Yeah, all that highfalutin. Yeah. And one of the reasons why it survived, the neighborhood right next door is Highland Park. So what's the effect on young people? Well, the baby boomer generation uh, became adolescents in the 1950s. These guys have never known want. Teens have more money and more free time than any prior generation. Shopping became increasingly important for them, and a vast new market of goods was available for them. Things like hula hoops, skateboards, bikes, uh, rock and roll records, 17 magazine, transistor radios. They had disposable incomes with an allowance of 10 to $15 compared to $2 in the 40s. These children were immersed in abundance from an early age. One girl who got a $65 monthly allowance uh, said, well, I have to save $10, but the rest is mine to do what I want to with. I spent about $40 on clothes and the rest on records and jewelry. All the teenagers are on that swing. We just find it neat to spend money. Now, parents during this time are more permissive than ever before, prompting one commentator to call the American family a child-centered anarchy. And by 1956, more than a million teens are arrested each year. Their biggest theft was car theft, followed by larceny, rape, beatings, murder. Uh, the one thing that's similar about all of them is they're pretty much immediate self-gratification. Um, but back then, what, what would society think was the cause of this sweeping, sweeping juvenile crime. Some claimed it was a lack of religious teaching. Others claimed that it was the, their use of automobiles, which gave them too much freedom. But finally, some stated it was the new frenzied music craze of rock and roll. Uh, named bequeathed to us by Alan Freed, a disc jockey in Cleveland. He noticed that more and more kids were buying the uh, rhythm and blues records that were then called race records because basically they were either by black or uh, Latino artists. And so he started playing them on his radio station, giving it the name Rock and Roll. Um, well, you had early performers like Chuck Berry, Ray Charles, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, suddenly became all the rage inspiring a young white truck driver born in Tupelo, Mississippi, raised in Memphis, Tennessee, to begin experimenting with his own rockabilly music, which was a mixture of gospel, country and western, and R&B rhythm and blues. This man quickly rose to prominence, his long hair and sideburns accentuated by a sneer, clad in a leather jacket with suggestively tight blue jeans, he became so popular that on his first uh, TV appearance on the famous Ed Sullivan show, because his dancing was so controversial, 
They only filmed him from the waist up. Wasn't a full body shot. So who was this guy whose music united so many? Elvis, Elvis Presley. Who, by the way, still has sold more records than the Beatles. But anyway, this rock and roll music was an unprecedented entanglement of racial, ethnic, and class identity. It was bringing people together. It was bringing people together as they were living further and further apart. Now, the suburban population, the biggest thing about the population growth during this time, that um, most of it was in urban or suburban areas. 97% of America's population growth. Now, why were people going out to the suburbs? Well, suburbs had more spacious homes, greater security and educational opportunities. You know, back in the way back machine, people in Dallas were saying, this place is getting too citified. We, we need to get, let's go to Plano. Yeah. And they lived here and it was nice and simple. They could drive their kids to work, I mean, school and everything like that. But then Plano got bigger and bigger. And so now, what are some people doing? Especially because where's the affordable, lower middle class housing? Yeah, it's not in Plano. To Melissa. And those places, they'll go out there and they'll continue to grow. And so, oh, you know, I don't like this McKinney. We need to get out to Melissa. We need to get out. Anyway, most of this took place in the Sun Belt, which was a geographical area that spread from the Carolinas uh, through Texas out to California. Now, this population spur in the South and Southwest would not have been possible had it not been for an invention created by Willis Haviland Carrier back in the 1890s. And does anybody here know what that invention was? And by the way, if yours breaks in the middle of the Texas summer, you will know exactly what it is. Air conditioner. Air conditioner. Now back in the 1890s, they didn't have it small enough and we didn't have the technology to make it affordable enough for most people. But by the 1940s, we definitely did. Now, the post-World War II Americans were spreading out within metropolitan areas. In 1950, the Census Board redefined urban to include suburbs as well as central cities. And in the 50s, each day, 3,000 acres of grasslands and forests were being bulldozed for the new suburban housing developments. The suburbs grew six times faster than the cities, and by the 1970s, more Americans lived in the suburbs, 76 million, than the central cities of 64 million. Ready for the next one? Now, what's the problem with that? More people living in the central, I mean, living in the suburbs than in the central cities, which have less people, which means they get less taxes and property taxes. Yet, it's the people that live out in Plano that drive down to Dallas, use Dallas's roads to work down there, uh, to go down and see the uh, Perot Museum, that go down there to see the Dallas Mavericks play, but then they leave. And so the cities have to do more with less money. Oh, and by the way, guys, guess who that's happening to right now? Yeah, Plano. People are driving in here from McKinney, from Crossford, Salina, doing their work, leaving. Oh, man. Now the reasons for growth. We shall look at William Levitt. Who was William Levin? He was a New York developer who was a leader in the suburban revolution. He and his brother built homes and made a fortune during the Great Depression. Because uh, he made it, he struck it rich when he developed on an efficient means of mass production for homes. Meaning, hey, we've got Model A, we've got Model B, or we've got Model C. Which one do you want? Well, I want a Model A. Okay, Zoop. They, they know how to build that exact line. And all the Model A's are going to look exactly the same. They might be painted differently inside the house. They're all the same. Same thing with B, same thing with C. 
but you do give a little variety. And um, after the war in 1947, he bought 1,200 acres of Long Island farmland where he built 10,600 homes that were immediately sold and inhabited by more than 40,000 people. Most of these guys were young adults under 35 in a thing known as Levittown. Now, how did the government help out? Well, the government offered low-cost uh, loans and insured up to 95% of the value of the home. The Federal Housing Administration made it easier for a builder to construct low-cost homes. Indeed, if you were a vet, you could buy a uh, Levitt house with no down payment and monthly mortgage installments of only $46 or 56, excuse me. Now, expanded automobile production and highway construction facilitated the rush to the suburbs. I mean, our car production went from 2 million in 1946 to more than 8 million by 1955. Local and state governments built many new roads, but the feds get involved in 1947 when Congress authorized the construction of 42,000 additional miles. Now, African Americans migrated to the cities of the North and Midwest, and when that happened, usually white neighbors would usually move out, beginning what was known as white flight. And many of the suburbs that they moved to passed obvious discrimination that refused to allow members of uh, other than the Caucasian race to live there. So the nation's pop suburb population in 1970 was 95% white. And just so you guys know, that whole Caucasian race, that just allowed them to prohibit who they didn't want there. Could be blacks, could be Mexican Americans, could be Asian Americans, could be the Irish, could be the Italians, could be the Jews, whatever other. Oh, and by the way, that's not true in today's suburbs at all. All right, the Civil Rights Movement. World War II helped spur a great migration of rural blacks to the urban centers of the North and Midwest. And after 1945, more than 5 million Southern blacks went north in search of better jobs, higher wages, decent housing, and greater social equality. So you had blacks streaming northward to places like Chicago, Pennsylvania, Newark, Detroit, New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C. But guys, it was no utopia. Many faced the same harsh realities they had left, like slumlords gouged them for rent, employers refused to hire them, unions denied them membership, uh, they were thrown into high project slums. I mean, in Chicago in the 50s, uh, the African American population more than doubled as they received 3,000 black migrants a day. Attempts were made to alleviate racial hostility by placing many black migrants into all black public housing projects. This basically laid the framework for the complex social problems that would flare up in the 1960s. You got it? So, civil rights, what's going on? Now, what was Eisenhower's stance? Eisenhower wanted to push things forward, but America was more than happy to live in a segregated America. Well, just because the majority is satisfied, does that mean that nothing's going to happen? No. Right. In 1945, no, 1954, sorry if my dyslexia showed up. In 1954, uh, you had the case of Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, where Thurgood Marshall who would later on become America's first black Supreme Court justice, <coughs> um, 
basically carried a case saying that separate is not equal in education. You cannot have black uh, schools and white schools. They cannot, they cannot be equal by the very fact that they're separated. Now, an excellent example of this is what is, do we have here on campus that's segregated? Restrooms. Yeah, restrooms, not equal, okay? Uh, and the same is true for education. Well, the Supreme Court heard them and they said, you're right, we do need to integrate the schools, but uh, schools need to do it at the quickest possible speed, meaning they understand how transformative it is, so they're going to give the school districts time to allow the integration to begin. Uh, on December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks boarded a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and a white passenger came up to her, told her that he wanted her seat, and she refused to move. Now, Rosa Parks was the secretary for the NAACP in Montgomery. And how many of y'all know that Rosa Parks was a setup? Because basically what had happened, I mean, look at Rosa Parks. She's not married, doesn't have any kids. She's, you know, calmly to the eye. She's pleasing to look at, you know, very well kept. Well, about a week before December 1st. In November, a woman came into the NAACP to argue about what had happened to her on one of the buses. She was an older woman, about 38. Her clothes weren't nice. She was a little bit fat. She had two kids. She wasn't married. She was not the ideal poster girl. But the NAACP decided to put Rosa Parks on the bus that that bus guy was the driver of. She sat in where, just like the other lady did, a white customer, just like in the other case, said, hey, get out of the seat. She said no. So the bus driver, just like he had done, basically kicked her off the bus and had her arrested. Well, this causes a young pastor by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to start uh, in combination with the Southern Christian Leadership Committee to begin the Montgomery bus boycott, where basically the blacks of Montgomery would not use the city buses. This might mean that they'd have to wake up two hours before they had to get to work to be at the carpool site that would transport them to work. Might mean that they had to walk two miles to get to that location, but they refused to ride on the buses. Well, what did that do to the Montgomery bus company? Well, within a year, they were almost bankrupt. So, the Montgomery Bus Company desegregated their buses. And because the blacks kept up with their boycott, it worked. All right, now responses to some of the advances that African Americans are making was by no means universal. Indeed, we did have things like the Civil Rights Act of 1957 plan, but in Little Rock, they were going to do an experiment with the integration at their central high school, which was, you know, a nice, um, up, it was a nice middle class neighborhood. It was less than a mile and a half from the Capitol. Uh, they hand picked, they had like 200 black students, and they picked. Out of that 200, they interviewed them all and picked the best 12 that they thought would be excellent representatives, the least offensive to go to uh, Central High School. So uh, the governor of Arkansas was Orville Flavis. And Orville Flavis was famous for fighting this tooth and nail. He said, segregation then, segregation now, segregation forever. Basically arguing that it was the state's right decision. The 12 kids went to school the next day. Little girls got pelted by uh, tomatoes. And they, you know, people were sh sh 
shouting at them, and basically they were refused entry to the school. So how did Eisenhower respond to this? He sent in the National Guard, and those kids would be going to school. And they were gained entry. Now, this is where the story usually ends. So most historians can, oh, that's a happy note. Well, Orville Flavus, who was once again the governor and a big time states rights guy, and now that the federal government was forcing them to integrate their schools, you know what happened in uh, the very next year in Arkansas? Because he refused to integrate them? They simply didn't have school. They closed down all the schools in uh, Arkansas rather than uh, integrate them. Now, also during this time, during 1953, Puerto Rican uh, immigration to New York reached 75,000. This is because air travel had become cheap and many were trying to deal with the industrial displacement in their home uh, territory. And the New York mayor, Robert Wagner Jr., tried to attract this population, believing they'd be a cheap and welcome workforce. However, in an attempt to attack the Blair House and assassinate President Truman, he, he was always a block and a half away, so he wasn't really threatened. But the guys that did it were from the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party that began to negatively paint the community. And by the 1950s, restaurants hung signs reading no dogs or Puerto Ricans allowed. Well, did this stop the migration? No, because by the 1960, the U.S. Census stated that New York had a population of 600,000 Puerto Ricanos. Ready for the next slide? A conforming culture. All right, corporate life. Now much of what we faced in American life during this period was the creation of a homogenized culture. I mean, suburban life encouraged conformity, where you work promoted conformity. On the new TVs everyone was buying, we were watching the same box, presenting what the normal family should appear like in TV. And remember, back during this time, there was only like three major networks maybe one or two independent stations. So everybody is watching pretty much the same thing. Now by the end of the 50s, white collar workers outnumbered blue collar workers for the first time in American history. Indeed, 60% of the population enjoyed a middle class standard of living, which was a huge birth. Because back in 1930, only 31% of our population was middle class. Well, where are these guys working? Well, the managers, teachers, professors, researchers, government employees, and office workers. Now, you also had, like I said, the corporations, you had the growth of big business. After World War II, big businesses grew even bigger. The government relaxed anti uh, Trust activity, huge defense contracts, promoted corporations. In 1940, the 100 companies were responsible for 30% of all manufacturing output. Three years later, they were responsible for 70%. Now, all of you are probably wondering about Professor Galloway. <coughs> what should I, as a woman, do in the 1950s? Well, a woman's place. Once again, just like with the men, conformity was emphasized. Indeed, Life Magazine in 1956 pre featured the ideal middle class woman. So this is what y'all aspire to. They were 32, they were pretty and popular, they were a suburban housewife and a mother of four who married at 16. She was an excellent wife, mother, volunteer, 
and home manager who made her own clothes, hosted dozens of dinner parties, sang in the church choir, worked with the school PTA, campfire girls, and was totally devoted to her husband. Now, y'all remember the cult of domesticity? We talked about that last section, you weren't here. But basically it's that the man's job is to go and work, it's a woman's job to stay home and take care of the kids. Well, the baby boom reinforced the notion that a woman's place was in the home. <coughs> I mean, after working in the factories during the war, they were forced to give up their jobs and go home. A Bernard College trustee uh, asserted in 1950 that women must boldly announce that no job was more exacting, more necessary, or more rewarding than that of housewife and mother. Two social scientists, Mary Farnham and Ferdinand Lundberg, published Modern Woman, The Lost Sex, where they stated that they could scientifically prove that women would only be fulfilled by accepting their natural functions as wives and mothers. Ready for the next slide? Now, religious revival. During this period, Americans are joiners. I mean, uh, social organizations saw an incredible rise in membership. I mean, Americans might join civic clubs, gardening clubs, bridge clubs, babysitting groups. All of these allowed the growing middle class a sense of community. Indeed, one of the places where they found that was in church membership. In 1940, less than 50% of the adult population belonged to churches. By 1960, 65% of the population belonged to churches. Yeah, sales of Bible soaring, as did books, movies, and songs with religious themes. Now guys, why do you think all these people are desperate for community? Where did I tell you most, a lot of people were working? Starts with a C, followed by an orc, followed by, yeah, a corporation. Guys, you're in a corporation. Hey, you graduate, you're there, you're starting with your family, everything's great, two years later. Hey, you gotta move to Synecdoche. We're gonna give you a $20,000 raise. So you move to Synecdoche, you pick up everything. Well, you go to these organizations, you go to the civic club and say, Hey, uh, I'm going up to Synecdoche. Do you know anybody up there? Oh, no, you need to talk to Jane. Talk to Jane. She's good. Hey, you know uh, any babysitters that are up? Oh, you need to talk to uh, Phillips. He'll know. Oh, hey, is there a good church to go up here? Oh, you'll really like Pastor Robert. You know, everything in the community so you can transfer from one community to go to another one. Well, what's going on in the uh, churches? Well, guys, it's kind of like Joel Austin. The prevailing tone was upbeat and soothing. Congregants basically wanted to be reassured that their own comfortable lives were God's will. But then also patriotism did take a uh, place in it. Eisenhower totally believed that the recognition of a supreme being is the first, most basic expression of Americanism. And without God, there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Now guys, do y'all agree with that? Do y'all agree that recognition of a supreme being is foundational to being American? Yes, no, maybe so. Why? Well, most importantly in our founding documents, where do we get our rights from? Government gives us no rights. According to the social contract theory, it only serves to restrict them. And we agree to that restriction in order that other rights may be protected. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that we have been endowed by our creator. Doesn't say God. It, it just says create something above government, the supernatural supreme being. Now, of course, here in America with our Judeo-Christian uh, beliefs, probably most people would say that's God as they see it, 
But like I said in the founding documents, um, you know, by our creator. In 1954, Congress added one nation under God to our Pledge of Allegiance. And by 1955, we added a in God we trust to our money. Oh, and by the way, Ramadan Karim. One more. Now, guys, you also have the marketing of religion. Like billboards across the country begin promoting local churches. TV commercials add, you know, the family that prays together, stays together. A Catholic bishop, Fulton J. Sheen, who you can still see him on the Catholic channel, basically he had a weekly television show that was a primetime hit. Billy Graham used radio and TV in promoting huge crusades. And to show the connection between the car culture um, and churches, you would have drive-in movie theaters that on Sunday mornings would have church there. Church services where people could just drive up, put a speaker in their car, and go to church. Now, um, Reverend Norman Vincent Peale believed in positive thinking, start thinking faith, enthusiasm, and joy, and by following this, one could become more popular, esteemed, and well-liked individual. Well, is everybody riding on that bus? No. Neo-Orthodoxy. You did have some critics of this uh, kind of feel-good religion. Uh, a lot of people, some people said that these ministers were shallow and misleading and professed religiousness without religion, a religiousness without almost any kind of content or none in the way of socially belonging, rather than uh, a way of reorienting towards God. Reinhold Nebuhr lamb blasted the undue complacency and conformity that had settled over America. True peace, he insisted, involved not cheap comfort and sedating reassurance, but the reality of a pain, a pain caused by love and responsibility. You go, guy. Ready for the next line? Stop looking at your phone, love. Go away. I'm not looking at my phone. What are you looking at? I'm taking notes. We're all taking notes. Cracks in the picture window. All right, social criticism. The first is uh, John Kenneth Gilbreth in his book, The Affluent Society. He was an economist that uh, attacked the prevailing notion that sustained economic growth would solve America's social problems. Basically, he was pointing out that the public sector would starve for funds and public enterprises were deteriorating. Meanwhile, John Keats launched a savage attack on the mass-produced suburbia in his cracks in the picture window. He called suburbia as having been conceived in error, nurtured in greed, corroding everything they touched, where the residents lived in neat rows of identical boxes spreading like gangrene and basically that they lived in a homogenous post-war hell. Okay, David Reisman, I will tell you now, I'm not gonna ask you any questions about this guy. He's like, he's like an old man, a bitter, ah, there's been a shift in the American personality. We used to be interrupted in that, you know, we listened to what our, our parents taught us and it was like a gyroscope and we were straight and even and people used to like that. Thing. Now, that's the outer directed personality. The, um, no, the inner uh, directed personality is that, where you do what you say and you say what you do. The outer directed is the new kind that knows how to manipulate people and can uh, you know, use people to do what they want. Anyway, the guy just sounds like a bitter old man. I, I won't ask you any questions about Rice. 
All right, alienation on stage. Have any of you all seen Arthur Miller's uh, Death of a Salesman? It's actually, it's actually a pretty sad play. Uh, the main character in this book is Willie Loman, an aging, confused salesman in decline, who had always seen success as by what he could provide for his family and his wife, but he discovers at the end that his family isn't happy, uh, and basically he feels like he's a failure. His son's not happy either, and basically the main sense of this play is the sense of alienation experienced by sensitive individuals in the midst of an impressive uh, mass culture. Ready for the next slide? And maybe you guys had to read this book in the novel, uh, J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Did y'all have to read that? Y'all have to read that here? Yes, no, maybe so. Actually, J.D. Salinger was like an incredible guy. I mean, the guy was writing. He had articles and short stories printed in the New Yorker, but he wasn't making any money out of it. And he had this one book, kind of autobiographical, uh, Catcher in the Rye, that he really wanted to write. He went off to fight in World War II, and basically, whenever he had downtime, he'd be writing this novel. Okay, it kind of helped him to keep his uh, mind in focus. But basically, it's about uh, Holden Caulfield and the individual struggle for survival amidst the smothering and disorienting forces of mass society. Holden uh, Caulfield finally decides that rebellion against this is useless. And if you haven't read the book, I won't tell you what happens. But the author does an incredible job of getting into the mind of a 15-year-old boy. Also during this time, you had a novel come out by an African-American uh, author, um, The Invisible Man. Uh, basically, in The Invisible Man, uh, the main character is a black man who's employed in the white world. Well, because he has employment in the white world, the other whites don't really accept him. Well, because he's working around whites all day, he goes back home, and the blacks, they don't accept him either, making him this invisible man. It truly is an interesting novel, and I didn't read it till I got to my freshman English class at UT Austin, and I found it very interesting. All right. Okay. <laughs> In painting, you had Edward Hopper, who explored the theme of desolate loneliness in urban industrial America. This is his most famous painting. It's called Nighthawks. Jackson Pollock, there's a picture of him right there. He was an abstract expressionist who claimed that abstract art is an effort to close the void that modern men feel. Basically, he'd lay his canvases on the ground and drip paint on them, which is why that form of painting is known as primitive. The Beats. These were also known as the Beatniks. Basically, these were people who believed that the dynamic of life is the desire for pure freedom, the liberation of self-expression, to surmount organizational constraints and discard traditional conventions. Who were they? Well, basically a collection of young writers, poets, painters, musicians, were known as the Beats or the Beatniks. But why were they known as the Beats? Because they were just beat tired of the world, man. Yeah, dig it. Some of the leading figures in this movement, there's Jack Kerouac, 
whose most famous work was um, On the Road, even though he wrote other books like Dharma Bums, Dr. Sachs, etc. He basically was a tall, handsome, athletic, hard-working kid from Lowell, Massachusetts, who went to Columbia University on a football scholarship. And in 1943, he quit school to join the Navy, but he soon grew tired of the Navy discipline, laid down his gun, and went to the library. And for that, he was discharged. Here's Allen Ginsberg. His most favorite, he, he's a poet, but his most favorite, his most famous poem is Howl. And basically, the way he wrote Howl, this is a pretty cool idea. He carried a little notepad around with him for like four years. And if he thought of a pretty image or a pretty uh, set of words, he'd write them all down. And after about four years, he took all these little phrases and basically mashed, rearranged them, mashed them up, and created the poem Howl out of it. That's Neil Cassidy. He was uh, very physical. Um, uh, he didn't look, there's a baby geese. Now I only see one. Oh, well. Um, uh, but he was very physical. He uh, really charismatic. William Burroughs was a graduate of Harvard in 1936 who studied medicine. Then he worked as a copywriter for advertising. He cut off one of his fingers when he was on a Van Gogh kick. Later on, he became a heroin addict. And as he was going through recovery, Allen Ginsberg uh, said, hey, why don't you write about it? And from that, his first book, Junkie, was made. Uh, he killed his wife while trying to shoot an apple off her head. Uh, he was a homosexual. And he lived in the, well, he lived for a spell in the Rio Grande Valley here in Texas. His uh, parents owned an orchard, and they moved him there during the trial, just in case the verdict went against him, he could just cross the border. What was their philosophy and works? Well, their quest for visionary sensibility and spontaneous way of life, transforming themselves into reforming the world. They were mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved. But their road to salvation lay in drugs, alcohol, sex, and a taste for jazz and the urban life, an affinity for Buddhism, and a restless vagabond spirit. When asked, where are you going, man? They said, I don't know, but we got to go. And parting words of wisdom from Jack Kerouac, uh, live, travel, adventure, bless, and don't be sorry. Now you ready to get into everybody's favorite thing? Politics! Eisenhower's rise to the presidency. Basically in the election of 1952, the Democrats chose Adelaide Stevenson. The Republicans felt it was time for a change. So their first candidate was Robert A. Taft. And so all of a sudden, uh, Dwight Eisenhower let it be known that he was interested in running for the presidency. And of course, when he could have been a Republican, he could have been a Democrat, but the Republicans uh, took him up on that. His vice president was Richard Nixon, a guy who had already cut his political teeth but uh, there were some rumors about him accepting bribes from foreign nations, and he made a TV appearance where he said, yes, I did accept bribes. bribes. Pat and I uh, accepted gifts from England, and he said, and we're not gonna give it back. And then he picked up the gift. The gift was his dog, Checkers. And everybody goes, aww. So needless to say, the election was a blowout for Eisenhower. Uh, all his states are the one in blue. Stevenson is the one in red. Red? So Eisenhower the president. All right, remember guys, before the presidency, uh, Eisenhower was in charge 
of all of the Allied forces in World War II. Uh, one of the reasons why he was put in charge of that is because of his excellence in administration. He would paint out the big picture of uh, the missions that needed to be accomplished and he put guys that he knew he could get the job done into those staffing positions. Basically his leadership was known as dynamic conservatism. Ready to go to the next one? Now we still got Korea going on because remember, yeah, they had uh, gone down for peace, uh, peace talks underneath Truman, but they stalled out and it took more than two years for the peace talks to finish. Uh, they were at a stalemate. Uh, the stalemate, however, finally was broken. Now, some people say that there were secret threats, like they were afraid of uh, the U.S. beginning its military offensive again, as well as now potentially carrying the war into mainland China that helped to end the Korean War. But remember, guys, the Korean War, no final peace talks were ever signed. It's merely a ceasefire. So it's still a relatively hot zone. Right? Well, the end of McCarthyism. Well, McCarthyism, it was popular as long as you weren't the ones being called the communists. Like I said, it ruined a lot of people's careers in Hollywood and entertainment. And he was flying pretty high, but he flew too high and he decided to have a trial of a private in the Air Force that he was accusing of being a communist. And they were going to be on TV. Well, when this starts happening, uh, other TV shows collect clips of his former speeches, showing how he contradicted himself uh, as he's interrogating the, um, the military guy before Senate. Uh, his arguments break down, and so it pretty much fizzles out. However, this whole Red Scare doesn't fizzle out before uh, one of the developers of uh, the Manhattan Project and our atomic bomb, uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, was considered a security risk and his uh, classified uh, status was taken away. All right, what's his forum policy? Well, his Secretary of State was John Foster Dulles, who uh, was big time into uh, aligning with George F. Keenan and believing that the uh, Soviet expansionist tendencies needed to be contained. And wherever it stood up in the world, America had to stand up even stronger against it. Well, what did we do with our allies or neutral people that hadn't picked a side yet. Well, for those countries to be the carrot, we'd offer the stick to the Soviets, but to other countries, we carried out the policy of liberation, which was, hey, go with us, you'll get economic aid, you'll get military aid, you'll get humanitarian aid. You ready? Well, remember, it's us and the Soviets, and you can't really do things in full view because it might kick off a thermonuclear war. So they have to depend on the uh, CIA heavily to do a lot of things like destabilize unfriendly governments like we did in Guatemala or help stabilize friendly governments like the CIA did in Iran with helping out the Shah.
Dulles and containment. Basically, what was the threat that we had against the Soviets? At this time, it was massive retaliation. You don't hit us because we're going to hit you back so hard, it's not even going to be worth it. Because we felt, you know, hey, we have the allies, we have the military uh, equipment. Later on, as the Soviets built up their own military power, this would transform into a policy known as MAD, or Mutually Assured Destruction. And because things were so tense, most uh, politics carried out on brinkmanship, which was, you know, right on the edge. Things didn't change a lot. Ready for the next song? Well, this gets us into a trouble, though, in Indochina. Why? Well, because, remember, before World War, what's Indochina? That's nations like Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos. Um, and before World War II, they've been French colonies. Well, during World War II, Japan came in and took them over. Uh, and then after World War II, France wanted to go back in and take control again. Well, the Vietnamese weren't so excited about that, especially one rebel leader up in the north known as Ho Chi Minh. Now, Ho Chi Minh had actually been our ally in World War II because he helped fight against the Japanese. But now he was fighting against our ally, France, so he was kind of the enemy. Now, why did we support a colonial power instead of one that wanted freedom? Well, because Ho Chi Minh happened to be a communist. And we were afraid that if communism won in one of those nations, that all the other nations in the area would fall like a bunch of dominoes to, communi communi to communism as well. Ready? So the French, they built up and they centralized their defenses at a place called Dim Dim Phu, believing that they could use that centralized base to easily attack uh, an insurgent enemy. Well, the only problem was they built it in a valley surrounded by mountains. And so all the uh, Vietnamese had to do was get artillery up in the mountains and just shell the Hueys out of the French, which they did which finally forced the French surrender at the Geneva Accords, where a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam was created. And, the, you know, the North would be communist, the South would be capitalist. This wasn't supposed to last forever. They were supposed to take elections and unify as one country. At that same time, we signed, uh, the, the, the Geneva Accords were signed, CETO was created, which is the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization that was supposed to be uh, kind of like NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but CETO was never as strong or as unified. Where's the next one? Well, then we get No Dien Dien. That's the leader of the South Vietnam. This was a guy who had gotten his education in America. He was a Catholic. Um, and when he went back to Vietnam, he wanted a lot of the Vietnamese to become Catholics as well. Uh, kind of big challenge as, I forget, it's either only 4% or 8% of Vietnam was Catholic. The majority were Buddhists. Well, in 1956, he sees that the elections are going to go against him, and it's going to be unified under the communist threat, so he refuses to have the elections. And because of this, you have the Viet Cong, or the NLF, which stands for the National Liberation Front, rise up to fight for a unified Vietnam. Ready for the next slide? All right, Eisenhower's second term.
The election, guys, it was the exact same thing as happened in 52. Blowout for Eisenhower. Ready? Now, we did have some foreign crises break out. Like in the Middle East, we used to be best buds with Egypt. But then Egypt wanted to build the Aswan Dam, and they need a lot of money for that. Well, the Soviets came along and they said, hey, we'll help you out. We'll give you that money. We'll also give you a lot of military stuff. So they flip alliances and they go and join the Soviets. And then they try to uh, patriate the Suez Canal, a canal that had been owned by English and French companies. Well, this causes conflict between them and Israel, so fierce that the United Nations has to get involved. And basically, the, when the USSR said they were going to send down troops to the area to help out the Egyptians, America brought peace to the area as soon as they possibly could. Ready for the next one? Meanwhile, in Hungary, they decide they're not crazy about being communists anymore. And they pull out of the Warsaw Pact, which, of course, the Soviets saw as the beginning of them pulling out of the communist bloc, which they didn't like. Now, at first, the people in Hungary, in Bucharest, totally got away with it. But then about two weeks later, the army arrives and puts down everybody that was involved with this revolution and make them go back into the Warsaw Pact nations. And what could America do? Absolutely nothing. Because if we got involved, it might start a thermonuclear war. Ready for the next one? Then America gets shot on October 1st, 1957. Where if you turn into the correct frequency on your radio, AM radio, as it passed overhead, you hear a tiny beep, 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 beep. What was it? It was Sputnik, Russian for traveler. Uh, basically, the Russians have been able to launch a man-made satellite into space. It circled the Earth 28 times before it was destroyed and re-entry. Now, why would America be so scared about that? Well, if you could launch a satellite into space, what also might you be able to launch into space? Huh? Yeah, a nuclear device. And so, and we hadn't gotten a successful rocket off the ground with a satellite yet. So all of a sudden now the space race has begun. NASA is created, or the National Aeronautical Space Administration, Defense spending has increased. The National uh, Defense Education Act of 1958 is passed that basically puts more money into math and engineering. What are the results of this for Eisenhower? Well, his popularity goes down. As you're having more money being spent in government, it should come as a little surprise that corruption goes up. And the executive branch got very little support from the legislative branch. What is the next one? Problems on the horizon. Well, this starts in Lebanon. Now, Lebanon during the 1950s was known as the Paris on the Mediterranean. It was a beautiful country. Well, but then Iraq wants to be able to exert more of their will on what Lebanon does. So they start paying for rebels to stir up trouble, to blow up buildings. Lebanon uh, cries for help to America. We send them money. We send them Marines. Our Marines are there until stability returns. And then we pull our troops out 
So it's kind of a minor success, even though Lebanon would never reachieve the beauty that it had, and basically there's still wars going on between Iraqi insurgents, Christians, Jews, and mess. <coughs> and West Berlin, Khrushchev is the new Soviet premier. And basically, he's making threats about how, you know, the USSR is going to pass America by and wave goodbye to it in its rearview mirror. But, because, you know, he was in the Great Patriotic War, which is what they call World War II, and as was Eisenhower, well, they were both military men, so... Ike, which is Eisenhower, kind of earned his respect. And both us and the Soviets agree to a peaceful coexistence. So there's kind of a thaw in the Cold War. It looks like we might open up diplomatic negotiations again. But then comes Gary Powers. Uh, Khrushchev and uh, Eisenhower had agreed to talk at Vienna, had a summit meeting where we would open up more peaceful things. Uh, then we had Gary Powers. Um, guys, remember, we didn't have satellites back then. So how do we get military information? Well, basically, they launched spy planes like the U-2 that would fly over Russian airspace with a camera mounted on it, and it would take pictures of uh, certain bases and what it needed to do. This had been a year, this had been planned like a year prior. This was like two weeks before the summit meeting. Um, this was a plane that was able to fly higher and faster than any Soviet missile. Only problem was they had just introduced a new Soviet missile that was able to hit the spy plane. Now, the deal is, though, America had built in precautions. Like, the spy plane had a self-destruct mechanism on it that would totally destroy the plane. There were no identifying tool things or anything to, so that they know this was from the USA. The pilot, Gary Powers, and just like all the other pilots for the U-2, he couldn't wear a watch, no identification, anything like that. Uh, after setting the self-destruct, he was to eject from the plane, and as he's floating to Earth, take the cyanide pill from under his collar and commit suicide. That's just the way it was, so they couldn't blame America. Oh, and by the way, a young guy had defected from America to join the Soviets, and he was working with the Army. And the name of this young guy, for all you conspiracy theorists, when this happened, was uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. But anyway, uh, they hit the plane. The missile strike basically blew up the self-destruct. So the self-destruct mechanism wouldn't work. Well, he jets out of the plane, Gary Powers, and as he's floating down to Earth, he says, you know what? I really like living a whole lot more than dying. So he didn't kill himself. So basically, the Soviets call us, and they say, uh, you want to tell us about this spy plane? And we're all like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Oh, well, maybe you'd like to talk to your pilot. Huh? And guys, after this happened, Khrushchev totally called off the uh, peace conference that was supposed to happen in Vienna. Um, it was canceled. We got uh, Gary Powers back after trading some of the Soviet spies that we had captured uh, in an exchange. When he gets out of the military, he goes and gets a job as a uh, helicopter, a news helicopter pilot. And he has that job for about six months before he gets killed in an accident that he had in that helicopter. Viva Cuba Libre! Meanwhile, in Cuba, uh, good old Fidel Castro, a guy who had tried out to be a catcher for the Yankees, and also tried to lead rebellions twice before in Cuba, got thrown out of Cuba both times. Well, third time's the charge, and basically he leads a rebellion against Bautista, and he wins. 
Well, how does Eisenhower react to this thing? Well, it's a new country and new leader, so Eisenhower's excited about it. He welcomes him. You know, it'd be great to have because Cuba, underneath uh, Bautista, had been great with America, the relations, and he wanted those relations to continue.